All right, everyone, we're gonna get started. Um, I know we've never done this before, so we're gonna to see how it goes. Um, let's try not to get too far off into the weeds. Which, yeah. I don't have my glasses on. Um, <laughs> I mean, like we always have really good conversations, right? But sometimes. But um, and also, I think let's concentrate on the code and, and not necessarily like the builds that I'll call stat and anything like that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Is he doing stand That's it. Um, so, everyone, welcome James and uh, we'll get started. Hi, James. <laughs> Um, so I emailed Josh a couple weeks ago. I said, well, to start, I started learning Haskell on my own less than a year ago, so probably around March of last year. And um, I emailed Josh a couple weeks ago, and I said, hey, I've done these reasonably large, for me, projects in Haskell, and I'd love to get some feedback on them. And uh, he basically said, why not show them, you know, as the presentation at a meetup? It's like, oh, I don't know if that sounds really good, but okay, let's try it. <laughs> um, so, anyway, I'll just get right into it. So, basically, I, uh, for my networks and distributed systems class last semester, uh, we were given an assignment, and basically the assignment was uh, write two programs, one a client, one a server, and they have to communicate over a UDP socket, and I'm going to feed in, the professor will feed data in, standard in on the client, and then he, ex he will read standard out from the server and ensure that the data was sent in order, was printed in order. Uh, he also, but you know, the, the wrench is that he would run it through a network simulator where he would modulate the bandwidth, latency, packet reordering, packet dropping, delay, etc. And <coughs> so we were learning about TCP, but he never said you have to use everything that TCP does um, in terms of like delay window, exponential back off, timeout, and all that. He just said, I, I need you to transmit this. Reliably, without using TCP. Uh, without using TCP itself, exactly. So no network primitives above a UDP socket. Uh, so on top of that, there was so first of all, you need to do it successfully, and then on top of that, there was a leaderboard. So uh, whoever was fastest got more credit, like depending on how fast you were in comparison to everyone else, how fast you did it, and how little overhead you did it. Uh, right. So, does not have to follow the TCP stack at all. It just has to pass these set of tests, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, as a result of it not being, uh, oh, and please ask questions at any time. Like, I'd rather have this be a discussion than me just. Talking. Uh, by fast, you mean development speed is fast, or like? No, I mean uh, data transmission speed. Okay. So, essentially, it would look like, and I'll show you on the next slide. It would look like. I'm going to give you one megabyte of data, and how fast can you transmit it over? Oh, and I'm going to drop 20% of your packets and do, uh, reorder 30% of your packets or something, right? So there would there'd be a slew of about 10 tests that you had to pass, and then there'd be five tests that he was testing for performance, and you would get graded on with a leaderboard, and you would get more points if you were faster than that one. So I thought, well, why not write it in Haskell? Because uh, I've never really written, up until that point, I've, I'd only ever written just games and little, little games and stuff. So I thought, why not try to interact with the real world? Um, which is the first slide. Basically, 15% of this assignment was code readability. And my professor came to me afterwards and he said, I couldn't understand your project at all, so I just gave you full credit on the readability. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Completely unreadable, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, what is this dollar sign thing? I don't know what that is. Um, 
Okay. So as a result of it not following the TCP stack spec, um, a lot of things, as you'll see, are not, they don't adhere to TCP. Like TCP does you know, slow start and all that, whereas my strategy is just like throw it down the pipe as fast as you possibly can. Uh, and there's no, there's no sin at all because you only had to write a client and server and no handshake necessary. So how did uh, Team Haskell do? Um, so my class was about 50, 60 people. So for, you can see, the, this is my rank, and then just for reference, I, I put the first, for, how the first person did. So it's, uh, it's transferring one megabyte five, uh, on a five megabit, megabit per second bandwidth, 10, 10 millisecond latency, etc. So we did pretty pretty well, pretty well I'd say. Uh, I was pretty happy with it. What size um, did you say the class was? About 50 or 60. 50 or 60. So, um, but again, a lot of this was, as you'll see, like there's some things in there, like yeah, my packet size is 10,000 characters. So, that's the other uh, Anyway, so before we got into the code, I figured I'd give you like a really high level overview of how I did things. Also, disclaimer, I'm pretty new at Haskell, so be, I, I welcome your criticism, but just be aware of it. Uh, so anyway, uh, as far as what the client does, basically I have three threads running. Um, one reads from standard in and writes to a uh, channel. One reads from the socket, the server, and writes to a channel. And then the client thread, which is the main thread, basically attempts to read from these channels and then using the input from those channels, it will step the server. Um, a uh, solution which uses forward error correction would probably take as a assignment. Um, I don't know what that is, so you're going to have to explain it. Um, uh, um, forward, forward, forward error correction, things like error correction code, like instead of correcting for corrupted edit, you're correcting the lost data. Um, so Send packets and kind of get them to get through your custom message. Um, and uh, Adam Langley um, has a cast of packets and doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you use a, use a uh, variable redundancy, uh, so you can actually like send an increasing amount of the error correction packets and then you start getting hacks back. And so you'll basically. Um, just to the amount of dropping that goes on the channel. But uh, this, 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 this would allow you to fire the whole thing off if you're done, if you're zero round credits and have that security loss. Every, uh, every person who's won this contest I've seen has either done compression or error correction codes. That tends to be what wins. In terms of like speed and reliability. So compression is I'm going to shrink the data size so, and trans and therefore effectively transmit faster. Right, right. Error right. correction codes is I'm going to uh, transmit and even if you drop my packets, I still win. Yeah. It's so like a read Solomon code or a tornado code or yeah. you know whatever you want to do that's in that space. Yeah. So I I didn't go as far as actual compression. Um, some people did, but the as you'll see, I tried to keep the data. What was actually sent as well as possible. Anyway, uh, okay, so server, as far as the server goes, um, pretty much the same thing. There's two threads one, three from the socket, right to a channel, one, and then just the server that reads from the socket, sorry, reads from the channel and prints out to standard out anything that it has in order. Okay, so, all that being said, I'm going to try to do this. I was hoping that I'd have. A, more space, and B, more space to have split screens. But, um, so I try to be as, I try to keep everything kind of around this, you know, this pure function that takes a client, the current time, um, possibly a segment that it received from, this is the client, so possibly a segment that it received from the server, possibly a string that I received from standard in, and then I'll put a new client. And all it basically does is receive an ACK from the, the server, um, add things to its unsent buffer, 
uh, retry anything that timed out, and then um, send things that were that need to be sent. So as you can see, this is the. Did I see a string in there? <laughs> Maybe string. Yeah. Is that your data? Um, that is what's being <coughs> centered in. Try byte strings. Okay. They're much faster. This seems like a good um, a good usage of this of state. A good place that you might use state. Um, so you have a state client. Um, it's um, get ls, and then um, uh, it has it's it's a monad, and then it has two methods or two things get and put that get you the state or let you set the state. So how would you use that here? So it's, so step client instead of being a client taking taking all these things, mm -hmm. it would be. Um, it would be a state client. It would okay. just be an object of state client, I think. And then each of the, the parts, it looks like what you're doing is is doing a bunch of things. Each uh, you might yeah. have like a state um, time and state maybe set and state. I don't I don't I don't actually know I haven't looked into what you're doing, but but you could have um, then you would have a function that takes the time segment and the string and creates a state state client. State client is actually, I haven't read this in, in a few months. Uh, the type state is takes is a function from uh, a state of A, a, uh, a state client A takes a client and returns a client at an A. So basically, it, it and, and then you would have a function that takes a time segment and string and returns this function that takes a client and replaces it. And then you could um, and use the, all the monad um, syntax. syntax to integrate it in, and build it. So a bit more on byte string, it's basically it's internally, it's very it's a pack representation where a string's like a, literally a list of cars. Uh, and it's got much more efficient operations like split, you, know, you can split byte strings more efficiently. And lazy, if you're reading stuff in, you want lazy byte strings. Uh, for constructing to ship things out, there's an AP, a, a library called Blaze Builder, which is uh, under the hood very, very efficient. Uh, they, they actually allocate buffers and like pack things in and then shove them all out to, to IO when you do it. Cool. Awesome, thanks. Um, so this is the this is the client itself. It holds a state which can be either finishing, closed, or established. Uh, it has an unact buffer which basically holds a segment and the time that we sent it. Uh, unsent, which is everything that we've read from sender to in but not sent yet, and to send, which is everything that we're going to send uh, the next time the client loop runs, and then. Uh, the last sequence number read from sent it in, the last sequence number we're acting the server. Uh, timeout, which isn't really used because I do no intelligent timeout. Uh, and window, which also is not used because there's no reason to hold. The, the server has essentially unlimited space for, for the scope of this project. <laughs> uh, cool. So, yeah, so. As you said, the things that I'm doing here, the first thing I do is receive an ACK, which I take uh, uh, possibly a segment, the time, and the client, and then return to client. So basically, um, just uh, you know, find the unact segment in my client, uh, remove it from unact, and then Another thing that I do, the one, the one very TCP-like thing that I do is I use negative hacking. So the server will return um, the server has a contig uh, like a contiguous buffer essentially that's waiting to print out, and it can't print anything out until the the uh, you know, the prior things have been printed out, right? So if if I'm missing packets two and three, I can't print out four. So if I if the server sends back an ACK for packet four, then it will say, oh, and by the way, I'm missing two and three. So 
what I'm doing here is uh, um, immediately the second I parse an act, I push all of the uh, NACT segments into two cent. I'm sure that this could, some, there's something, there's some way to do this better. If anyone knows. Uh, okay, and then it's as far as send on send goes, it's pretty simple. I'm just moving things from my unsent buffer into my to send. To send will get read in the client loop in, the, in IO. Uh, ret retry just walks over the current buffer, the current unact uh, buffer, sees if anything has expired, and if it has, then uh, move it into two cent. All right, so this is the actual loop. Um, so, yeah. Does the order of the elements and set in two cent matter? Are you just checking for membership? Um, Um, does it really matter? If it doesn't matter, you can just use data set. Yeah. I'm trying to, it, it, I guess it doesn't, well, if your packets are not getting reordered, then it, it, would, be, it would be helpful to send them in order just so the server doesn't have to reorder them. But if there's a high reordering rate or dropping rate, then but I would say it's still probably better to use for this. So, um, actually, this is a question that I had specifically. So I use this. I wrote this this guy try get, and all it does is check if the channel is empty, and then if it's not, if it is, return nothing. If it's not, uh, return you know just segment. And I noticed that the is empty on the uh, IO channel is deprecated. But I really like, and I, I couldn't find any way to, to have a non-blocking read from the channel. Does anyone, is there a way to do it? Is there, in, in, with the STM channel you can? There is a... Cool. Um, that requires using STM, right? Well, yeah. No, that was definitely something like mid project that I was like, oh, I probably should have used this, but it's 4 a.m. <laughs> three hours left this time. Um, uh, yeah, so I try, to, I, I try to read from both of them, get the current time, parse the segment, and step the client, which you saw here. And then let's just sneak it in. And then I print to the, I send uh, to the client via Fort IO. Um, not that it really helps performance that much, but I was trying to squeeze as much performance out of this as I could. Uh, could you fork every time through this loop? Yes. Okay. Is that bad? I don't know. Depends on if you're doing anything that needs concurrency. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's sending it's sending via socket, but I'm just um, I'm assuming that there's no there's no performance issues. I mean, if you come around, is it okay to write to send things out of order? I guess it is since you're doing yeah. WP. Yeah. <laughs> I guess um, actually, if you have a lot of stuff pulled up as, as a standard input, they actually have a performance penalty for doing that for that because you don't actually start to send anything out. Until the thing that's reading from from uh, standard, you mean if this starts to run before that, is that what you mean? Yeah. That makes sense. Mm. If, he, oh. if he reads and then 
forks and then reads and then forks and then reads and then forks. Nothing happens until the reader gets on schedule. Hmm. I, I was just under the impression that those were really good for digging into highly nested data structures. Yeah, I mean, lenses make it easy to dig into highly nested things, but it also makes it easy if you're um, just grabbing one or two things out of just a flat but um, long record to just grab those couple of things out without having a million underscores. Okay, this it would be like calling in an airstrike to take out a yes. Yeah. No. What <laughs> <laughs> a reasonable uh, airstrike! It's not, air, it's not very expensive. It's a very cheap airstrike. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not in Iowa. We don't have a training. That's right. Unmanned airstrikes are never cheap, sir. It's an unmanned airstrike. All right, because they're trying to bust. Some of us like lens and some of us don't. Let's put it that yeah, way. Are controlled by a you should look into it and see if you like it. <laughs> okay, so. And they end up taking it. All right. All I, do, all I do after that is check if the if we're done sending. If we are, then uh, send a fin, which really does very little in this case. Um, but let's sell it. So, yeah. Basically, I just spam fin uh, because uh, I don't really need to be that reliable. I didn't really need to be that reliable in this case. Um, okay, so let's go. Look, let's go take a look at the server. So the server's kind of simple. Um, it just has a state established or closed. Uh, it's got a two print. Got a buffer, which is all of the um, segments that are out of order that we can't print yet. The last sequence number that we printed. Um, so basically, if it's if it's a duplicate, if the sequence number of the segment is less than the last thing we printed, because so we already printed it, or if any of the sequence numbers in the in the buffer are equal to that sequence number. Sort. Yeah, sort. Uh, oh, oh, number. yeah. This was. Um, this is. This doesn't actually do any functionality. This is just for. This was just for. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so this is really ugly. This function right here. Uh, basically, I'm trying to pull out consecutive. Uh, segments from the to print buffer while deleting them 
from, sorry, from two, um, I want to pull them out of the buffer, put them into two print, and delete them from the buffer, and then increment the last sequence number on the server. So this seems like a place for a fold, um, one of those places that I've just kind of um, said to my partner and I that we're just going to do it. But if anyone has any advice, please. And then if it's a dupe, uh, I check if it's a duplicate, basically, if it, no, I'm sorry. <coughs> if, it, if it's a duplicate, then don't remove it, don't add it. If it isn't, then add it to the buffer. So the server is the thing receiving the data the client is the thing Yeah, I realize that that kind of doesn't make that much sense. Confusing. Yeah. It's fine. That was the, that was just kind of the assignment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good call. Okay. Uh, all right. So if the duplicate you throw it away and if not you... If, if it's a duplicate, then I just return the same server. Isn't then I add it to the buffer, and then that gets the buffer gets uh, everything that needs to be printed will get pulled out into the to print and then printed in the next IO loop, sure. which is right here. So basically, I try to get something from the client. Um, I parse the segment that I received. I, I step the server. Uh, if there's something to print from the client, uh, then it's to go. So right here is where things actually get printed out. Uh, I, every, so everything that I, I, I can print, I print out to standard out. Uh, I empty out to print and I then fork off a send act, so sending the acts with the uh, negative acts also to the client to tell him what I'm missing currently. And that's pretty much the... Uh, Send both acts and acts? Yeah, so what I do is if the... Okay, yeah, so that's good. So a segment has a type, uh, sequence number, data, and a hash. The if it's an ACK, if the if the segment is an ACK, then I will in the data I will add in um, a list of sequence numbers that I'm missing. The server is missing, and then the client can say, "Oh, okay, I'll just resend those immediately and not time them out, not wait for the time." You're going for speed. Yeah. Although, really, are you CPU bound or are you network bound? Because if you're, it's mostly network. Yeah. So, it's probably not. It's probably a good idea, but it probably doesn't make a difference. I don't know. Strings can be slow enough to make it even for network, but sometimes yeah. They're linked lists, so they're going to cache fault a lot. Mm. Uh, you, don't, you don't need to explicitly define the seg, right? You just derive it. This guy? Derive, yeah, so at the end of the data declaration. Um, I, um, is, that, is that the default derivation of equals? Okay. Yeah, you could, on 31, you could just say deriving. Right, yeah, I just didn't. I guess I just didn't check if this was the default derivation or not. I'm pretty sure no. yes. that that makes that makes yes. a lot of sense. It should be. Yes. Yeah. Why did you define the show to be just numbers instead of? Why did I? Yeah. Just for to use as little data as possible over the over the pipeline. Oh, you're sure you're sh you're using show to send it uh, for the pipeline. Got it. Right. So just to serialize the strings. Um, I, I realized that I could have used compressed data or some other much smaller format, but yeah, yeah, yeah. another part of this was like debugging, so like obviously I want to be able to see if there's a problem, I want to be able to see what kind of packets I'm receiving. Um, 
be interesting to have a flag somewhere that lets you switch between. Yeah, yeah. Between I, ideally, compacted, yeah. Uh, compacted. For sure. Um, okay, so oh, so how are you doing parsing? Do you get strings and then you parse them into your segment object? Yeah, so I just wrote this guy. Probably could have used, well, another another tertiary requirement for this assignment is you are not, you were not supposed to, you were not supposed to use third party libraries. Um, mm. Mm. Okay. So, <coughs> so I realized that I could have used like parsec library. and whatnot, but um, hmm. This was all kind of within the bounds of, of this project. So I basically. Yeah. I just. I would. I don't know. I was. The, the, the professor was talking about. Yeah. The throws using. Well, it's, it's not. It's not because. It's not machines. really because like he doesn't want you using it. It's because th these have to be run on lab machines, and so installing things is kind of. Right. Mm, okay. Um, but. Not like that actually mattered because he had to like manually run this himself because no one else used Haskell. So yes, <laughs> and I had you know I had to install the network package um, just to use the yeah. UDP stuff. UDP stack. Uh, oh, so yeah, so parsing. Basically, I just I just have a type delimited segment and I split the, the string on that and then if that doesn't add up to four then it's nothing if, if the, um, if the right if the parse if the type doesn't parse and the sequence number don't, don't parse then I get nothing and then if it does all parse then I check the hash against the, I hash the segment without the hash and check that against the hash that was given to me. So they're doing corruption? That's what I, yeah, that's my corruption check. It's just. Oh, I mean, he's corrupting your packets sometimes too. Yeah. Is there a reason the input is not maybe? Sorry, what did you say? Is there a reason for maybe? Um, that is just because the uh, output from the channel because I'm, I'm using my little try get thing, we'll return maybe. In that case, you can just have this be from string to maybe seg, and then just uh, use join instead of uh, direct function application. Because maybe it's a moment. It's just a style thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I definitely, I do a lot of this. I do a, a lot of this a lot, in a lot of places. Which just the moment happens. Right, right. Oh, do we have monad -y stuff as well? Um, yeah, but it's not like anything. It's just the I.O. stuff, really. Um, and like this guy's that I've been on, it's not really, that's not even that stuff. Um, I really meant I.O. stuff. Cool. Um, yeah, so this is the this is that try get that I told you. This was like my implementation of this. Um, so your timestamp, did you have to turn that off to turn it in, or was he okay with you writing shit to stand there? No, he actually required you writing some certain things to stand there. Oh, okay. With a timestamp. So got it. Okay. All over the place you'll see like literally timestamps. I thought it was just for plugins. Is that how you get your grade? Did he's like running some analysis over the time stamp? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I think it's I think it's more just oh. the data itself. But it's like if you were to go go and like run your program then people would see it. <coughs> he also probably was trying to force you to debug your own code. Well that would be that's pretty much it, as far as the walking through all the code goes. Um, if anyone else has anything to ask, please do. Try getting else. Try getting else. What's on safe? Sorry, I missed the first part of that. Try Right, but it would, it would get picked up on the next iteration, right? So yeah, but if something else removes from the channel, then... It's only one thing ever removed from the channel. Okay. And it's this guy. And this actually only runs in one thread.
So how limited did you make? Did you import nothing? Yeah. Except for the networking. We yeah, had to write. We had to write this make file. Split red. So I tried to just keep it to the most primitive stuff that I could. Um, I ended up doing another project, which was uh, the raft consensus algor algorithm, which was another assignment. And I ended up doing that one in Haskell too. Um, looks a lot better than this, but it's a little, a little bigger. You kind of understand how RAP works. I figured TCP was a little better. Um, okay, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, if anyone has anything else to ask, please do. Or else, if you are really curious and you really want to read or fork this project, my uh, GitHub username is James spelled backwards. Uh, one thing I will add uh, comment on. The, at the very beginning about error correction codes. Uh, those only work if the environment is the problem. For gem, for most networking purposes, that tactic actually applied globally will slow everything down. Because you're basically, it, it's congestion is the problem. And error correction codes, you're sending more data. And if everybody's sending twice the data, you have twice the congestion. So if you're in a cluster environment, compression is what you want. There's no, my connection wouldn't be interfering with anyone else's yeah. in this case. In this case, yes. Oh, not in this case. Okay. Yeah, in this okay. case, you're fine. I see what you're saying. Is there a reason not to do compression and error correction? Uh, you want to compress and then yeah, yeah, of in, and then code. You don't do the reverse, that's basically oh, canceling yourself out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, no, you still get the benefits of the little one, but you don't get the compression. Right. You get, yeah. Actually, you get no compression. You, you get encrypting. Compression is basically the opposite of, of, of ECC. Um, well, <laughs> actually, actually, because of the um, range but, over which ECC operates, most versions of compression that people use for streams will not actually be smart enough to yeah. compress away the ECC. That too. <laughs> but for for typical networking, which is you know like the way things around here are wired, it's congestion the problem and not the environment. If you're transmitting data on the surface on the sunny side of Mercury, yeah, error correction is substantially more important. Well, I, 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 would, I, would, I, would, I would compress and then erase your code and then check something. Yeah. But it, but it also makes sense to have um, erasure codes on Wi-Fi. It's just too bad that you can't have that just not go in and yeah. So the error correcting code is basically sort of like intelligent redundancy that you're, you're like, since, since he's, he, received the, he receives the correct data and he, he transmits it, so he can duplicate right. it in, in ways that can, uh, can suffer a certain amount of data loss yeah. without mm -hmm. uh, needing to wait. So basically, uh, I'm going to take your data, I mean, you're going to give me, four, say, four bits. Uh, I'm going to encode that through some some set of equations into seven bits. And then you can lose some number, you can lose, I think, depending on the, on the exact code, you can lose some small number of those, and I can still solve the equations and recover your original form. But like a usual example would be like, you give me 64K worth of data, and now I turn it into 256K worth of data, such that 64K plus just a little bit is enough for me, to, for you to be able to reconstruct the original 64K. Yeah. Out of any 64K, so if you, no matter what you, you write out of that stream. Sure. But the problem is, is that if what makes the network not function right, more well, bytes is because and, right. there's it's in capacity, and I have to drop some packets because otherwise I can't you know, keep going. Then everybody expanding to four times the data is not going to help matters. Does this have a uh, <laughs> tragedy of the commons problem that, that like or like? If I add that to my algorithm to my networking, I screw everybody else to improve my own. Not network. necessarily. That's what. That's more like. That's more why error correction codes aren't common in, yeah. in most networks. An example where, where it works well is if you're broadcasting. Let's say I'm broadcasting to everybody who wants to receive, you know, this BitTorrent. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or whatever. You know, the equivalent of right. So I just want to be able to start dumping data to the network, and I don't really want to wait for an acknowledgement. Right, then I can just start. I can just start broadcasting from the first of those 256k worth of packets, 
and then you listen in and you tune out. You don't have to ever acknowledge to me, tell me that you got it, whatever. Yeah. Um, that, that's where the, like, the real magic of the whole ECC, Reed Sullivan, Tornado Code. Okay. Or if I'm, if I'm transmitting to say the asteroid belt, then that congestion's not the problem there. Uh, it, it's, it's noise. And, and like round trip like yeah. yeah. Latency is that you don't want to wait for ads. Right, right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to send it once and have a pretty damn sure uh, shot that you're going to get the whole thing. Yeah, um, the, the other case where it helps to, to use error correction is like not using it as forward error correction. But if you have, if you have like a noisy channel or a channel that gets a lot of dropouts, well, you can like just pre-compute like a certain number of packets in your window and, and when you get an acknowledgement that says how many things were dropped from the person doesn't even have to tell you which, which things you received, just the number you received in this window. And then you can just transmit as many error correction packets as are actually needed without having to know which things you need to retransmit. Is it possible to have some of the packets be packets and then have the error correcting codes? That's usually how they work. Okay. It's usually some amount of that is your original data and then various linear combinations of your original data. You'll typically do Between certain compression like, stuff. You could still do compression. Uh, no. Information theory. Basically, compression is I take it. I, I reduce it. you to the minimum information uh, and right. then I have redundant information to, to make an error correction code. Yes, what what techniques did you use for debugging that app when you're running it? Uh, I want to give you like sophisticated answers. And I don't have it. Just uh, like right. trying to read timestamps because he basically forced. I don't know if you saw this, but <coughs> he basically forced us to litter these timestamps all over the place. So uh, you know, I would use timestamp like receive app or sequence. Uh, printing sequence number 50, right? Um, so you could you could really figure out most of the, that uh, via this. Uh, I will say that uh, we had a previous time before this, it was writing a network bridge, and I did it in Python, and it sucked a lot. Um, so like debugging that was a lot harder than debugging. Uh, but that's mostly just because of the Mostly yeah, because of the compiler. Did you find yourself, uh, you know, stepping through the debugger, uh, or it, well, the bridge was was a uh, like a so you, you basically wrote a bridge and then he would connect your bridge to itself five times, so and then run it through a network simulator also. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so Prince uh, debugging didn't really debugger didn't really help there, and print statements kind of helped, but it's but. In that case, it's even more challenging because it's like, you know, bridge one says this, bridge five says this, and chances are they're not going to be printed out in the right order either. So, um, but I, I guess my point really was just that using Haskell, uh, I don't know if it lowered the development time, it lowered the headache time for sure. <clears throat> Send each packet once. Uh, so to send, you're applying that to the to send. Uh, oh. Then that's a list, right? You're getting yeah, 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 yeah. Why are um, there duplicates there? I don't know. So it might have just been one of those things where I saw a duplicate packet once, and I kind of just threw this in there. <laughs> yeah, sure. That <laughs> Right. It's not really a good solution to the problem, <laughs> but right, so yeah, a lot of this was done. I think a lot of this was done like under pressure. So. Yeah, I understand. Um, what was it to send? Um, to send is the is the the a list on the client. A list of yeah. segments. A list of segments to send. So it includes the whole segment. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm definitely comparing. I would definitely be comparing the whole thing.
Definitely would make sense because I do a lot of linear <coughs> list scanning. Uh, yeah, definitely. I don't know if I would you here, but a uh, typical performance uh, trick and the first thing you do is go and make all the, every field that's a primitive make it strict. Uh, usually, almost 99% of the time, that'll get things faster, right? Yeah, so that's, that's something I've. Yeah. I've after reading more Haskell code that's out there, I'll be seeing more. So definitely, definitely picks that up for the next time after this, for sure. Uh, anything else? <coughs> yeah. So the only thing I'd add is that some of your functions look like they don't have very clean fall throughs. So if it doesn't do the pattern matching, mm -hmm. you just get an error. So one of the things that I try to do in my yeah. code is just make sure that there's always a base case in case someone else tries to use it and it's not um, yeah yeah not they're, they're at, least, at least at least give them like error in this, this case uh, in this function this is impossible at least throw them a bone until we actually get real real call stack tracing so well, I mean but I mean don't you get a rogue no you don't no you don't not a call not a call stack no no that's fine I don't I feel like most of them have are actually most of them seem to be reasonable. Wait, how is your second rec act ever hit? Oh, fit. I didn't see fit. Yep, that number. Yeah, I, I feel like most of them seem to have reasonable last cases. All the ones I'm seeing right now. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, the there is a GFC one in front of if you compile with the flag, I definitely did not compile with the warning flags. I actually like just learned about that that warning flag today. They're doing in Haskell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing Haskell. Uh, we'll tell them. That's a good question. Uh, I guess I would say I think the biggest thing, the reason that I like doing it in Haskell, this is more of a functional programming thing, but the Haskell's compiler helps with that a lot. The, I really like the reducing the problem down to a pure function that takes, takes your client and some other data and then returning a new client. Uh, you know, no matter how that's done, whether it's be with state or whatever. Uh, I think that that's a really clean way to think about problems. It's also, a, if I had written tests, it would have been a nice way to write tests. <laughs> yeah. Where's, where in the code do you first um, instantiate the client type? Like, where's the first instance there? As you can see, the, uh, well, the window doesn't matter, but the timeout is two seconds. The window is 10,000, not the window. The packet size is 10,000 characters read from standard in. Um, could I ask a like advanced Haskell question here? I mean, this is not a beginner's question, but if you go to that line 186, this is something I notice when I compile my Haskell programs. Client is a record structure, right? There he's um, 
He's instantiating that just by using regular um, syntax. Right. But if I use record syntax to yep. instantiate, say, client, and I forget a field, the client, the compiler doesn't warn me. It, it'll, yeah, it should, if you put on wall, it should yell it will. on initialized field, yeah. Okay. Yes, there's a, there's some there's reason it's not showing up for that. Yeah, there's a separate warning. What happens if you try to access an unreliable field? It gives an undefined, undefined field access. Yeah. So the compiler yeah. will let it build, but it won't. Yeah. But if you use that syntax, the compiler won't let it build. Well, because this syntax is. Well, this syntax the itself is a function that takes all the arguments in so, order. So it will. And you omitted something, then it'll return a function. It's a partially applied function. Yeah. function. So that is actually, well, unless you always look at your warnings, that's the safer way to. Uh, well, depends. Like this one, if you start, if you swap the order of two fields, now you change the meaning. Yeah. Plus, this sucks to read. <laughs> um, my recommendation is just always turn on wall yeah. of some form, but then yeah. other people here will. I, I I build with W. Since wall wall changes from compiler version to compiler version, what it, what it, what it yeah. whines about, okay. and they've <laughs> explicitly said to me that they're not going to make that in any way, shape, or form reliable, so that we can build a yeah, nice I, policy I, around it. We you may have you may have to <laughs> be careful about it. <laughs> I, I, I build I, I used to build with W error. I used to ship stuff with W error, but uh, the, my they're too sloppy about for, about library version numbers and and. And library versioning, and, and you'll end up getting weird uh, W error build failures because somebody, you know, added or something and made something redundant, and then it doesn't build on like seven eight, and it does on seven ten or the reverse. I had that happen. Okay, so or somebody uh, other word who's scary thing that wall will tell you about, but that you don't get told about otherwise is if you miss a pattern in your function definition without wall, it won't. Even yeah. Which is just as bad as undefining New Yorkers for no kind of Yeah. Yeah, well, that's having an undefined field in the record continuations. We go back to send those seven. I mean, it's also just faster if you. You don't have to compare segments. For gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Definitely. So, um, question about your types: Is do do um ack and fin <coughs> segs have uh, s hash and data associated with? Them? Yes. Okay. That's intentional. Um, like is that in? They're just blank. Part? They're just blank. Yeah. So Perfect. here's a popular refactor is like if. If you never are going to use s hash and that in a seg with type fin, and I don't I don't know if that premise is right, but if it is, then you want to make a state like that unrepresentable by carrying the fields like only the, only the fields that match the type of the seg. You know, in the in the data definition, yeah. Won't yeah, mm -hmm. well, you do that with the <coughs> generic? Oh, I'm saying to, to refactor the type set into an ADT. Or ADT. Yeah. Make yeah. illegal states unrepresentable, <laughs> I think the tagline is. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yes. <laughs> I heard that thing about red black. I read somebody who did red black trees with unrepresentable, like unbalanced red black trees were unrepresentable in the type system. And I was just like, yeah, you should use a lot of dependent types in this too. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can do, you can do it completely. Can do it. I look at those. You can do it with just like oh, some basic yeah. JVT. Uh, okay. Chris Okasaki has a presentation on that one. Can you go back to the block of code that was right above the comment of Monadi? I forget which. I can also file that was then. I just turned up there. I can also yeah, so if you go scroll. up a little bit. It's not even <laughs> 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 
So, in that thing, you're taking split up and um, indexing into it a bunch. One thing that you could do is just um, use a case statement to um, match on it being a list with four elements and then have, you know, the otherwise thing be nothing. But I would still have to. I would still have to run parse. Right. Yeah, you'd say like. Uh, I gotcha. Split on splitter seg. Uh, rather case um, split on splitter seg, of um, then your list with the uh, like first, second, third, fourth goes to whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so are you going to um, implement some of these suggestions and tell us the performance <laughs> games you play? Yeah, maybe. I don't even know if I still have access to the, to the server, actually. Like the network's also, the, the class is over. The so readability games. Actually, yeah. That's what I'm more interested in. Did, so, and I did another project, as you said, I did another project with Raft. That took me 60 hours, uh, but that was much, much more difficult. Because that was, that was again, that was a, I don't know how familiar you guys are with Raft consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just you know, getting servers to agree on uh, data. <clears throat> but it, it was one of those, oh, you write one, and then we're going to connect I'm going to connect it to itself five times, and then we're going to use it as a as a key value store. And I'm going to shut down two of your servers randomly here, mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I need a certain like 98 percent, um, 98 percent uh, accuracy of data. So that was that was much more challenging, but I definitely improved a lot on that assignment, and I'm actually trying to write one now. On my own, uh, I'm trying to do the Kademlia um, distributed hash table thing, but so and and things are things. I'm like using Stack for that since it's not for a school project. I have like my I have freedom to be kind of using all these new things that I've learned. You think you'll go back and rewrite this? I think it would be fun to go back and rewrite this as an actual TCP implementation and not uh, not a hacky mm. pass these <laughs> tests. Please give me an A. Did, did you get an A? I did. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> what what languages did the other top finishers use? Um, I would say probably ninety percent Python and and maybe like six percent Java and then two percent C. Oh, someone did it in Rust. But the ones in the top five. Uh, actually, I think, well, the people who did it in Rust were pretty fast. I was going to ask how Rust did, yeah. 
they did, they did pretty well. Uh, people, but I think that you know a lot of people at the top were using Python. So it's yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. It seems more like a choice of outcome protocol it has a much more effect than yeah. Than and it's also like what you because you know the key with mine was was knocking really because. I don't rely on timeouts at all. I rely on the server saying what he doesn't have. Right. Um, and there's a number of different ways that you could look on there. <coughs> uh, all right, well, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you.